So I put up there over 13,000 years of human history or history revealed through human skeletal remains. It's kind of older than that, but 13,000 is conservative, right? We, we find older sites all the time. So it's getting older and older. There's several colleagues of mine work up there and have been doing research. So when we talk about some of these cultures, they've been there for some of them, 13,000 plus years, which is pretty cool. That's a site in 1901 on St. Lawrence Island, which if you can kind of look all the way up, you can see St. Lawrence Island is that orange island off the coast of Alaska right there. So Gamble site is one. And they actively hunted walrus and all kinds of other things. So we see a lot of cool stuff from Gamble. But we're going to talk about each of these locations. But before that, one of the things that we always do in Alaska, and I tried to get started at Garrett College when we were when I was dean for a little while, was to do land acknowledgments, to acknowledge the people that lived here before we got here, right? So I live and work on the land of the Denina, and the Denina are the people in red, you can see in Alaska. They are Athabascan speaking group, or Dene speaking group. That's red up on that upper map. Um, we, we acknowledge that the University of Alaska Anchorage is located on the unceded territorial homeland of the Denina people. We are thankful for their stewardship of the land, and grateful for the collaboration that has been possible between indigenous Alaskan groups and our department at the university. So everything I do is usually driven by collaboration, right? I don't do a lot of bioarchaeology unless the indigenous groups are also interested in me doing that work. Um, so keeping that in mind, I just want to say that we're, we're on the unceded land of the Shawnee and the Seneca people here at Garrett County, right? So that kind of something to keep in mind. Disclaimers, I will not be showing human skeletal remains from indigenous communities just because of, out of respect, a lot of the communities don't want the human remains showed. Sometimes it's okay, sometimes it's not, but I will show you some different things about human skeletal remains. So anatomical references, um, and I'm gonna I'll highlight some work that my friends and I have done in Alaska, a um, bunch of us. So this is just Gray's anatomy. There's a skull, right? Everybody wants to see a skull. Uh, got a couple other bones we'll talk about, but sometimes it's all we find, right? Um, background on me and what I'm going to talk about in the presentation. So just going to walk you through what I'm going to cover. I'll talk about the anthropologist and bioarchaeologist at UAA, the archaeologist, I should say, a brief overview of the state of Alaska in general, what bioarchaeology even is, right? Um, my mom asked me when I was doing this, she's like, you're going to be a what? I'm like, I'm an archaeologist. She's like, but her rule when I was going to school when I was a kid was not to go to school and dig ditches for a living, right? That's why she wanted me to go to school so I didn't dig ditches. So I went to school, became an archaeologist, dug ditches for way less money. <laughs> like, what? It's all right, I love it. Uh, so a bioarchaeologist, I dig and I analyze human skeletal remains. So it's a mixture of biological anthropology and archaeology. Uh, I'll highlight what archaeological, biological, and molecular research can tell us about history of people in Alaska. I thought it'd be kind of fun to highlight two major things in Alaska that aren't necessarily my research, but that are really kind of neat that have been done in that state that you wouldn't find anywhere else for different reasons. Um, and then some examples of projects I was able to work on with my students and colleagues that were kind of cool and interesting. A little different, right? So me up here, this is me teaching class maybe a year before I became dean at Garrett College. Uh, those are fake human skeletal remains, but the students are learning how to identify differences, and some of those are replicas of indigenous people, um, you can kind of see a little bit. The one that's kind of looking at the very closest to me with that weird hand gesture, there's a skull that looks kind of elongated in the back. That's artificial cranial deformation. So what you can do is you can wrap a baby's head when they're still a baby, and you can shape their head permanently to give them a kind of a unique look, right? I always, my joke is I always said I wanted to do this with my son. My wife said no. So his head is mostly normal, <laughs> I guess. Uh, but. I primarily work with historic remains and um, sometimes really old remains or ancient human remains. I'm interested in questions dealing with identity, health, disease, but I've done a lot of work on conflict and violence, so I often get like, stereotyped as a guy that studies violence for a living. I'm like, well, I've looked at a lot of violence, but I'm really interested in pro-sociality and how people get along and work together to form these communities, right? But we'll talk about social inequality, ethics, and then repatriation, which is the returning of the bodies. I'm going to include other people that I worked with, some graduate students, people that have graduated from the program or still in the program, or people that are colleagues in the program. So here's all of them. I got photos of different people that I'm working with. But faculty, Jared Smith, with his arms crossed, is a new archaeology professor at the University of Alaska Anchorage, but he worked for us for a number of years, and then he did his PhD up at Fairbanks. So he's been in the state doing a lot of work for a long time. 
Margaret Grover used to be an instructor at the university, but she got a better paying job and now works for the US government doing archaeology full time. Uh, she's shown there looking down, and that's, in, uh, that's an archaeological site. She just dug that house pit. Um, Kaylin is shown by the sign that is in Kotzebue. She's standing next to the sign on the other side of that picture, but I just cut myself out so you can only look at Kaylin. Uh, Ted Parsons is the one in the hole. He is a graduate student working on his second MA. I should say third MA. He has an MBA too, but that was from many years ago. So he's working on a second master's degree related to anthropology. This one's anthropology slash engineering, so kind of a mix of the two. Um, Tyler is, works for the Army Corps of Engineers. He's the one at the top looking, uh, kind of doing some survey work. Emily works for a private engineering firm, so she works for any engineering projects that happen to be going on in the state. And then Norma is down at the bottom and she works for her own uh, village. So she works for one of the tribal corporations that she's associated with, Chickaloon. Um, but you, you'll see them pop up here or there. Maybe not their photos again, but their, their names will come up. So before we talk about Alaska, we have to think about the scale of Alaska. So this is a picture of Alaska I took from a plane, a small little plane, just kind of <laughs> jumping from village to village. Um, and this is the Kuskokwim River, so it's the Yukon, Kuskokwim form a delta in Alaska, and they're the, Yukon's one of the largest rivers in North America. Kuskokwim's not that much smaller, but they form this large area, and so there's villages scattered throughout this area, right? But thinking about scale, that's Alaska plotted on the continental US. So the amount of territory it covers, right? So the joke is always, if you go to Alaska, you buy a shirt that says Texas. Like, they're not the largest state, right? They mock Texas. Alaska's huge. I mean, if you look, the Aleutian Islands are over in California, right? And you've got part of, like, southeast Alaska sitting in Georgia. That's a long ways, right? I've driven parts of it, but most we fly. We, there's not a lot of roads in Alaska. So we've kind of got these, a lot of airplane trips. Some of my students have been out there in helicopters, drop-off locations, remote locations, all kinds of stuff, right? Um, <laughs> I put that picture in there on purpose. One of my students made this after we had field school. That's we had a field project. I was grading them. Um, that's me out in the field that we kind of made this, I'll talk about it, a bear farm. And he made that. That student now got a master's degree, but not in anthropology. He's a residence house person, so kind of like Rich Schofield here. Um, but the point of this picture is to show you the ecologically diverse nature of the state. So we have places where it's Arctic tundra, and there's no trees, right, and very little vegetation. And then I'm standing in a forest in Anchorage, right? So like that's a huge difference in terms of things we think about. Some of you might have heard of the body farm at one point. It's where they, in Tennessee, they test what happens to human remains. They put human remains on top of the ground. They put human remains in the ground. They do experimentations on human remains. They let animals get at them. And the idea is like, how do we solve forensic cases? Because we know how human remains decompose. In Alaska, we don't really have an analogy for that. So we really need a body farm, right? There's several of them now. Michigan's probably the closest to our environment, but it's still not the same, right? It doesn't have tundra and permafrost. Speaking of permafrost, we're gonna talk a little bit about permafrost, but this is a 2016 article talking about the loss of permafrost. I have several projects coming up over the next few years that are related to permafrost erosion and loss of like things like you know villages and cemeteries and all kinds of stuff, right? Um, but it's also infrastructure damage, so engineers are, engineers are trying to figure out how to make stuff so that it doesn't affect it in the permafrost, right? Because the permafrost shifts, buildings lean over. If you ever drive to Alaska, you can be out like near Toke, and you'll see the power poles are kind of all swayed different directions. That's just the changing permafrost, right? It's constantly shifting. Um, consequence of that is we have short field seasons. Um, last year, I was in some place in August, but at the end of August and it was starting to shift. We were starting to have snow come in and then we were gonna lose the season. Um, this is us in this area down here, this area down by Bethel and West. Uh, the, this is kind of a location that's out there, I won't necessarily say where, but this area was a little further south, so we were out there in October, which it looks real pretty in a couple of the pictures I'll show you, but it's kind of cold, right, it's pretty cold. Um, and that's just showing you the village sites. So the map above shows you where the actual sites are on the landscape, but this is interesting because it's an ocean site, right? But they build along beach ridges. So the oldest sites, we can find them and then we can go to the next beach ridge and it will be a little bit younger, the next one, the next one, and then you get to the modern village. Showing they've been there a long time, right? They just moved as the oceans changed. 
biocultural diversity, there's a lot of that. So this is just language groups, but these are the big language groups. Um, I told you I work in Denina area, but there's a Lutic, there's a Nungan, there's Atna. I mean, all these different groups, different languages. We're gonna talk about Nupiak. Um, I just showed you Yupik land, where they're at. So each one of these locations, different ethnic groups, um, there's been interactions between them over the years in different ways, but they have sometimes completely different subsistence strategies, right? And if you've ever been, if you ever go to Alaska, you go down where the Klinkit live in a uh, place like Juneau. Juneau's very different climate. It's kind of like Seattle, if you've been to Seattle. And Anchorage is a little bit more, it's a little colder. Fairbanks is super cold, right? Because it's continental and it's far up north. So they're up in this like Koyukon kind of area. Um, what's bioarchaeology? That's a selfless plug. You can read my book. No, I'm kidding. You don't have to read the book. We are going to do a second edition, though. We're working on it right now. Um, this is 2013, we wrote a book about bioarchaeology, integrated approach to working with human remains. We just got under, well, I think we're signing the contract to do the second edition, but because things have changed that much in 10 years, right? It's been a decade and things are drastically different than what it was 10 years ago. But just quickly, there's subfields of anthropology, there's cultural anthropology, there's linguistic anthropology, there's archaeology, and then there's biological anthropology. So I'm technically a biological anthropologist, but I've worked a lot in archaeology and trained in archaeology, and that's where I sit in this middle ground. So I sit where bioarchaeology is. Sometimes I work on cases that would be forensic, maybe, in nature, where you're working with the medical examiner. Paleopathology means old disease. Sometimes I work on cases that involve disease. Um, I've had tuberculosis individuals that you can see on the bones, other kinds of things. And then skeletal biology and osteology is just like what you might teach in anatomy, right? How you identify bones. So all these things are part of what we do. Um, what we're trying to do, all of us, is work together to reconstruct the history of a site and tell the story of a people. So I'm gonna walk you through just this real quickly because I wanna show you the stuff. I wanna show you the interesting sites that they worked on. But think about the archeologist, the geneticist. So I work with molecular anthropologists oftentimes. Depends on if the group wants DNA analysis. Sometimes we send things away for isotopic analysis to figure out what kind of isotopes are in um, certain soils and groundwater and all that kind of stuff, right? So it could be a lot of us working on one project, but we work on site and mortuary context, where the body's buried, what the area's like, what is it, was it a city, was it a rural village, right? We reconstruct demography, how many people were there, how many people were missing from the burial assemblage. Uh, nutrition and stress, activity-related changes, trauma, and then markers of relations, right? You don't have to know this at all. This is just standardized methodology that we look at. Same thing I just said, but just kind of thinking about when we do all this, we're trying to keep standardization. And this is always being refined, right? People are testing it, making sure we're doing a good job. So far, it still all works. I can do it with most any set of human remains. And what we like to do is create these osteobiographies. That's a long quote from my book again. With, uh, or actually, I mean, that's an article that we wrote. But that, what we said in that was this, that all it is is doing all those things we talked about, right? It's writing a biography about a person. So this site, Tota, is in La Plata, New Mexico. This is a site, it's fairly old, about 1,000 plus years old. That site is worked on by Deb Martin and several other people, and they did osteobiographies for every individual they found. This is one of those individuals. So you get an idea of what we're talking about when we look at bodies. So that person was a female. She's approximately 30 years old. She's from La Plata site 65030, just a designation, right? You don't have to know that. She has a large cranial depression, and she has a fractured pelvis. Um, one of the things that Deb has spent a long, lot of her career studying is captives and captive taking, taking people and making them do work for you and live in your village. And she suggested over the years that maybe this person's an example of that. Because there are other people buried at that site with like grave goods and other things. They're different than this. So we build these osteobiographies, and we do this for all the communities. And sometimes, like I said, we do destructive analysis. But it depends. It depends on if the group wants it. Years ago, most nobody wanted us to do any kind of destructive analysis, right? There's a lot of distrust um, with anthropologists in general, because we've done some things. We've stolen some bodies. We've uh, put them in museums. <laughs> we have a whole history of that. If you guys watch Indiana Jones, you kind of get that from that, right? He's always like stealing stuff and like putting it in a museum. It's like, we don't do that anymore. Uh, right? we, we ask if they want us to do that. But we, so we don't always get to do destructive analysis. But these are examples where this is, stuff can happen. So radiocarbon dates are great. If they want to know how old the site is, sometimes you can test the bone, find out how old it is. I'll show you an example of that. Um, if they want to know some of the isotopic variables, this is looking at Fremont and Utah, but this is a 
different collection, different uh, set of human remains that I worked on as well. But they looked at the isotopes there. Or they want to know DNA. They want to know who's related to who. So we're running some DNA projects now. Um, those take a long time, despite what you see on TV. <laughs> really long time. Ancient DNA is tricky. It's like way easier to take your DNA, have you swab and spit into a cup and send it off in the mail and get something back. But ancient DNA, you like things are missing, they're fragmented, they have to do all kinds of, a lot of work to make it work, right? When we're doing this though, we're looking at patterns, we're just trying to figure out what's going on and violence is up here, but I'm not gonna focus on that because I just want you to think about like every single one of these sites I'm gonna show you, that's what we're doing. We're doing a bio, biological profile, sometimes we're doing DNA, not radiocarbon dating, but we're looking for patterns. And everything I do is biocultural in nature, so the person is part of a bigger system, is all that means, right? Cultural anthropology comes back into play. I can't study a group without studying the culture. Now in the old days, they did just that, right? They would just take bones and they'd send them to a museum, and there'd be some guy in a coat working on bones and identifying stuff and then would not talk about the culture at all, right? Which seems kind of goofy being that your culture ref is reflected in your bones, right? Um, we'll talk about some people and the activities they're engaged in, but no connection to the culture, it's problematic, right? Bioarchaeologists don't do that anymore. We don't do that anymore. Um, history of what archaeology, biological anthropology, and molecular anthropology can tell us about people in Alaska, it's the fun stuff. There's a cool book, if you're interested in a popular book, my friend wrote it, I'm super jealous because she's a really good writer, but that is called Origin, A Genetic History of the Americas, and it's a popular book. It's like one you can get at Barnes and Noble, right? I mean, it's like, I, my books are not popular books. They're like <laughs> academic books, they're not fun books. My, mom, my, my family always sees me like, I read part of it and I fell asleep. I'm like, oh, okay, that's funny, good times. But Jennifer Rath's a wonderful writer, she's amazing. So, and she's running DNA on a couple projects for me right now, so she's fun to work with. She has a lab, she used to be at the University of Utah, she's at the University of Kansas. But fun book if you want to know more about this, but it's all about how people got to the Americas and she kind of gives you a whole summary in a kind of an interesting way. But back to that date I told you, 14,000 years ago, this is kind of a model of people crossing Beringia. If we were talking in a different setting, I'd just talk about the scale of Beringia, but when I was first going to school, we talked about land bridges. When I think of a bridge, I'm like, oh, it's narrow and people are crossing this narrow little bridge. That's larger than the state of Alaska. That's huge, right? I just showed you how big Alaska is. So that's like, nobody knew they were on a bridge. They were just people living there. Unfortunately, all the shaded, light shaded stuff is under the ocean, right? So people are diving to find more information. They're doing underwater archeology, span which is pretty cool. But that stuff is under the ocean. Some places it's not that deep. Um, but you have, 14,000 years ago, you have people going back and forth. And that's important to think about too. People don't just go one way, they go back and forth. We also have things like mammoth crossing at different times, the horse is crossing, which is kind of cool. Horse starts in North America, ends up in Asia. You have all these different things going back and forth. One of the things, that's me by the way, in the beard, a little bit portly. Um, but that, a while back, that was me at Swan Point, 14,000 years old. That's one of the oldest dated sites, accurately dated sites in North America. Now there's a lot of debate about what's the oldest site in North America. It's not my research. People I'll show you in a little bit, they argue about that. But they, that one is pretty well established. You see Bluefish Cave up there is older, but there's debate. But Swan Point is really, really old. And we were working on that. There's Ted, again. He's 3D modeling some stuff at a site near it, which will be important, because we're gonna talk about something they found there. But they find a lot of sites in Alaska. It's not like they found one that's this old. They found a couple that are like 12,000 years old, one that's 13,000 years old. They're all over the place, right? So we know people were there. And it could be there's an older site just be, waiting to be found. Um, this is from Swan Point recent article if you're interested in that kind of stuff, but you can see where they're dating the soils and they've got dates for each soil, each horizon, right? And the important part of this is when you start to find these soil, it's like you have to find evidence of humans, right? And you have to find evidence of human artifacts and stuff to be able to say this is old. Um, I got to look at some of the stuff at the site and see some ivory and stuff, which is really cool. It's about 11,000 year old part of the site that I saw, so 3A maybe, that area. but. They've gone all the way down to 4B, right? And they've got a pretty old site. And they talk about how well documented it is. Nearby, we have Upward uh, Sun River. That's a site where it's about 12,000 years before present, and that has human remains. It has two infant remains, and they were able to get DNA out of those remains, which is usually really, really hard 12,000 years ago, right? I mean, it's not easy to get that kind of stuff. But Upward Sun River, is Ben Potter and others have worked on. This is some of the stuff that people ask, questions they ask. They said, the Upward Sun River site is an ancient campsite in interior Alaska where the discovery of child, 
A child cremation of, in 2010 provided unique insights into the lifeways of Americans. In 2013, a team of archaeologists discovered a burial of two infants dating to 11,500 years ago. Situated before the earlier cremation, age puts the children at the very end of the last ice age. So they had hunting tools nearby, like spear points, um, and Upward Sun River was not a cemetery, but like a, re a residential camp with a few fire pits and other things around it. I'm showing you DNA on Upward Sun River. So if you look, you see that USR1, that's Upward Sun River 1. Um, and then there's up on the map up there showing you how they're dating it to some of these other old sites. But this is old. So they've got a new article that's out now and they've, they've updated it. But that, they've connected some of the burials. They know that people, how people are interacting. And then one of the cool things is some of these old burials, we connect to living people. Like this person has DNA that relates to that person 13,000 years ago which is insane, right? I mean, that's pretty cool. So we have some really old burials, like in Mexico, there's a really old burial. Um, and then Kennewick Man's 9,000, but. So these early children give us an idea of what people were doing in Alaska, and we can start asking questions. So one of the cool things about doing these kind of collaborative projects, and it was done, I should have made sure I'd mentioned that, with the Tanana Chiefs. So this was done with the tribe. The tribe is the second one there, Robert Sattler, Tanana Chiefs Conference. They were interested in knowing this information. They had these two infants. Maybe at a different time, different place, we wouldn't have looked at the bodies. But because there was trust between these archaeologists and that, that group, they were able to run DNA and they found all kinds of interesting stuff. What shows us is this is one of the first places, this is the first place in North America, where, or in Americas in general, where people arrived. So this is where it begins, right? So Alaska is kind of the hotspot. So I thought I'd show you something old, and then I thought I'd talk about something fairly recent. So we all went through a pandemic, which was horrible, right? Well, that was not fun, but there was other pandemics through time. And 1918 flu is a big one. But 1918 flu has an intimate connection with Alaska in good and bad ways. And it has a, and I'll talk about both, but you can see some of the different pandemics I put up here though. You have influenza, flu pandemic, but we could talk about cholera outbreaks, um, tuberculosis, other things that have happened. But right now we're gonna talk about influenza. This is just an impact on native groups in the lower 48, but living in close quarters, and if you've heard about residential schools and some of the boarding schools kids were sent to, I mean, they're now finding a lot of bad things, right? These are not great schools. Um, they were also gonna be exposed to the virus, so the virus got, was worse, they were close quarters, people got sick. Native peoples and villages across the U.S., including territories of Hawaii and, Al Hawaii and Alaska, sustained staggering death rates. Some communities lost almost all of their residents. And I'm gonna tell you about one community in particular where almost everybody died. And it was a horrible tragedy. But it also was a place that we could come back and learn something about the virus. So an ancient uh, village, an Alaskan village, um, led to a Spanish flu breakthrough. So they were able to go to this village. Um, it's mission, it's Brevik mission. I put on this, uh, this is one of the people running like an Iditarod race. That's the trail race, so you can think about sled dogs. But that is the village, but that's kind of a replica of where they are running the medicine back and forth, when the supplies back and forth. And that's the origin of why this village got the flu, was because whoops, people in Nome were going up and giving supplies. So it came in through Nome, which is a port city, and it was also during you know, times when mining and stuff was still happening, and then it went to a small village and a lot of people died. So there was a doctor though that was really interested in the virus and he was at a talk, kind of like my talk right now, and he's listening and they were talking about what, what could we do? And so this is a quote from William Hell. He says, everything has been done to elucidate the cause of that epidemic, but we just don't know what caused the flu. The only thing that remains is for someone to go to the northern part of the world and find bodies in the permafrost that are well-preserved and just might contain the influenza virus. So over lunch, with the faculty member, he starts asking questions at the University of Iowa, Iowa Carver College of Medicine in 1950. He goes up there in the 50s with the crew and they excavate some bodies and they extract part of the human remains and they try to run DNA and it doesn't work. I mean, 1950s DNA is like not so great, right? We're barely, we haven't figured out the double helix in 1953, right? So they're not, it's not great. But in 1997, he goes back. This is a picture of him back. 46 years after his first attempt to rescue the 1918 pandemic flu virus, he goes back up there, he finds a grave, excavates some of the grave, one of the graves, and is able to get viable DNA with community permission. And what they find is the 1918 flu 
is the same flu as H1N1, which was kind of an outbreak in 19, or in the early 2000s, right? So we had an outbreak of H1N1 when I was teaching the class like this in like 2016, or maybe a little earlier in Alaska, and I was like, my students were like, yeah, whatever, and I'm like, ah, like, you know, a town of 88 people, 80, I think 80 of them died? I mean, it's a lot of people, right? I mean, this can be a very extreme event. So, I want you to look at the names, I'm not gonna read them all, but those are all the people that died at Brentwick Village that were written on the cross. And this woman, Colleen Milky, has gone through and identified all the names and given ages to them. But you can see who these people were, right? And the cross at Memorial, as a memorial to them. And so she says, Angie Bush, Alston, a teacher at Brevik Mission, and her children, Caitlin Kopik Alston and Levi uh, Tuvik Alston, photographed the grave marker for me so that I could extract the names for those buried there. And then she thanks them. But thinking about who these people were, because we talk about the 1918 flu and what they were able to do with this permafrost body, but these are the people that were actually there, right? So that's another interesting one that connects, that's unique in Alaska, is because permafrost. Permafrost preserves all kinds of things. We have permafrost melting now, I talked about infrastructure, but we also have human remains that are coming out of the permafrost, like this one. And this is going to be examples of things that we might need to study in the future. Um, and then this is the University of Alaska Anchorage, just one photo looking over kind of the health sciences, I think. Engineering maybe is over there too. Um, but some of the projects that I worked on with colleagues, I just going to show you some fun ones, I think. So that's my bear farm. I'll show you another picture of it again. That's a couple, that's one of my former students. I think she has her master's now. Uh, yeah, it's Mary. Mary has her master's and she's fully employed as an archeologist. I think you make it more money than me. That's all right then. <laughs> uh, but they are, we are doing stuff there. This is the department webpage. Um, I just pulled up. But one of the things we do is just look for isolated human remains sometimes. Sometimes construction projects reveal human remains. Um, we do a lot of 3D modeling and facial reconstruction now. We're trying some of that. Um, but we are often involved when there's cases of human skeletal remains. I get calls like, hey, we have human skeletal remains. Can you look at it? I'm sure. Sometimes they come to the lab. Sometimes I fly out to the location and look at them. And I'll show you some examples of flying out to them. We're often asked to identify cultural affiliation for state and federal agencies. The first question is, is it indigenous? And are, is it archaeological, right? Because then the medical examiner doesn't have to do it, which is not, which is valid, but they don't want, that way we can separate it out because there's still a lot of people, there's homicide cases, there's other things that they are supposed to work on. So get the anthropologist to do it, right? Often these human skeletal remains are de delicate due to the taphonomic factor. So once we take them out of the ground, there's a chance they might fall apart, right? And they might not last. So we, we work quickly, usually. Um, this is my lab. That skeleton in the back, I'll show you again later. I buried that in the bear farm. I actually buried that little plaque you can see in the back. That's a Halloween prop of a skeleton, like in a fetal position. Uh, I buried that too, <laughs> made my students dig it up. Uh, and then I made them map it and draw it in place and draw every bone because I wanted them to practice, right? But when we, we have this kind of stuff, and I train them in the field like that so that these students, which well, I, mean, I think every one of them has gone on one of these projects, can go out and do these community-driven bioarchaeological projects. So this is me flying out to a village. So I leave Anchorage Airport. I just thought it'd be fun to walk through. And I get to a Bethel, which is a hub. It's about 13,000 people in Bethel. It's fairly large. And then I get out to a village that's, you know, in the hundreds, right? And that's where it will work. So at this village, first thing we did was meet with the tribal council, talk to the elders, find out what they wanted. I had to explain what I was going to be able to do. And then we went out and excavated the human remains where they showed us where they were. So here we are. And then we found a house pit. So we put a test pit into that house pit. Um, and Margaret Grover and I went out and did this work. This is probably what led to me loving this work. I mean, I was a little nervous. I'm like, I'm gonna go out to a rural village. I don't know what I'm doing. All right, like, I know how to do archeology span and I know how to do bio, but Margaret was amazing. She's a really good archeologist. She'd been doing work in Alaska for like decades. We had a really good experience and we did a lot of good work and I think the village was happy. We ran radiocarbon dates. We got a radiocarbon date, let's say around 700 years ago for both the house pit charcoal and the human remains, which is great. So it kind of put them in the same age range. And then we found a whole bunch of houses all along that area and some more human remains. We're like, oh, this is like a village, right? And we were able to, we tried to run DNA, but the DNA was not well preserved. So we didn't get a viable hit on DNA. We ran some isotopes. It was the same kind of deal. But that, that project led to many more. This is back to the one you saw already. We went out to this project a couple years ago. Um, I was Dean actually, I was up there at one point. Flew out to this village, we've run DNA, the DNA samples as of 
last couple weeks are, have been, we've got quality DNA and they're starting to get mapped and run now, and so they're running DNA on these human remains. And the goal is to be run that DNA and then compare it to living people in the community, right? And see how they're related, which is pretty cool. But also, this is a really old site relative to the time period when people are moving around, so it's an important site. So we got decent radiocarbon dates from that. Uh, I told you I study violence. I thought I'd put one violence thing in there. This was a set of human remains that somebody had in their house on their mantle. Or no, maybe it was in a box in the garage. Anyway, somebody found it in the house. I, this has happened to me multiple times, so I have to think of which story it is. Anyway, people have them in their house. I'm like, oh, Grandpa had the skull. I'm like, oh, it's great. So they had the skull, and I get the skull, and I'm working with my student, Emily, and I are working, and as we're like cleaning out the inside of the skull, there's like steel shot falls out, and I'm like, oh, that's not good. And then I see the shotgun trauma, and I'm like, oh, man, that's not good at all. So I call the medical examiner. I'm like, all right, so I got shotgun trauma, but here's what I think. I think it's... I think it's post-mortem. And that perimortem means at or around the time of death, right? Like, that's like homicide. Post-mortem means that somebody shot at something a long time afterwards. And I'm like, I think that's post-mortem damage. I'm, but my student's like, well, how would you, I mean, are you sure? And I'm like, I don't know. So we took a tooth, and we did some radiocarbon dates. And we sent it off. So one of the things they can do is not only date how old it is, um, but they can now also date how recent it is based off of the nuclear explosions, right? So if you look at this top graph, it shows you like a spike, that's the nuclear bombs. Everything since then, if you get a younger date, if you have somebody from 1995, they're gonna have a different radiocarbon signature, isotopic signature, and they can tell you that. So they can be like, this person died in 1995, which is kind of a new thing, so that's what we were hoping for. Came back about six, about, we'll say 600 years old, and I'm like, well, they didn't have shotguns 600 years ago in Alaska, but I did grow up in rural parts of Utah and other places in Idaho and people shoot at things. So I think somebody shot at the skull, they realized what it was, and then they took it. <laughs> and then many years later, it ends up in our lives. So it was not a homicide case, but it was an interesting case, because there's no examples of people shooting skulls after death. It's not a common thing, but well, I have one. I'll end with, uh, I'll talk you, work you through the bear farm. So those are my kids. My son is 18 now, that is not 18 years old, but that's him out there. Um, that is my former colleague, who's a historic archeologist, making a bouquet for the bear. He felt bad for the bear, and I was like, I mean, okay, sure, whatever, <laughs> like I'm used to doing this. Um, Norma, who came up a little earlier, we were talking about her kids. I kind of traumatized her kids with dead bear stuff, with like a, bringing them to the territory. Anyway, my kids kind of grew up around it, so I think they were more used to it than I, they should have been, but he didn't want the bear to be sad, so he put some stuff in there. And then we would bury that bear, and we'd dig it up again in like a year, right, so students could see forensics. One of the things we do with this is 3D modeling. So we use a lot of different technologies, like the camera John has back there, connect scanners for gaming systems. Old cell phones have it. My iPhone 13 and plus, all the others have like a LiDAR type system in it you can use. All different ways. Ted's the expert in this, by the way. That's Ted's expertise. His second degree is just all this. He's just doing, how do I 3D model better? And he's using engineering classes to figure that out. And he works with an engineer that's really good at that. We've, those are fossil remains of like about 1.5 million years old. Those are a cast of them, so we 3D modeled those too. Those are not from Alaska. Those are from Southeast Asia, the island of Java. But what we can get is things like this. That's one of the bears. So those are photographs. All the blue little squares are where he took a photograph. And what happens is that the computer software can align those, right, digitally, and then create a 3D model. And that's the bear, and it looks like a heat sensing map, but it's really a depth map that's showing you what's closer and what's further away, so dark blue is really far away. And I can tell you how far that bear was. And then we can move it around in 3D space, but I thought you'd like to look at the human remains more. This is the fake skeleton that's in the back of my lab. That's individuals wearing my pants and my boots. And I uh, went and bought a shirt for him at a thrift store, but I, I had to find a right shirt, and I found the first shirt I found was the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I thought, ah, that's probably not cool, right? Like, I buried, <laughs> like, that's our, not rivals. I mean, obviously, I work with those people, but I was like, nah, I won't do that. And then the second one I found was, like, Virginia Tech, and I was like, oh, that's not good either. So Mr. Pibb seemed safe. So this is Mr. Pibb, but he has my wallet and business card stuff in there, but, because I made him do a forensic case, right? But you can't actually see the body in that profile. That's the 3D model that, we, that the software is able to create because of the, the sensors, right? So. This is interesting, it's bioarchaeological bio and archaeological, but it has no human remains. This is a footprint. We're gonna talk about a footprint that's thousands of years old. So Jared Smith did this site nearby. You saw him digging and Ted taking pictures by that really old site in Alaska, it's right next to it. And so he found this site and he worked on it. 
um, and we published a paper on it, but this is the footprint. He was smart enough to be able to, oh, that's something. He excavated it, he cast it, and then we brought the cast back. We 3D modeled the cast, and then we also 3D modeled because he cut out this footprint, and we modeled that too. And then we were able to do cool things like heel depressions. But if you look, you don't see any toes, right? And a lot of the footprints, why wouldn't you see any toes? Yeah, right? So we think moccasin or some sort of muck luck or something like that. So we had, we had a grad student step in some mud with a muck luck, and it looks about the same. <laughs> so what we did, we did some, that, that didn't make it into the paper, but it was kind of like an experimental thing. But yeah, that's just a footprint that's shod. So you do find shod human footprints, and so there's the outline of the actual foot, right? And then working with this, we have also tried to do 3D modeling, and I'm just gonna show you a couple of these. These are just like, these are cast you can buy but they're also, two of them are Alaska Native and the other one's indigenous from the American Southwest. But they're cast, they were in the museum, right? Which they shouldn't have been in the museum, but they were at the museum. And so people went there and then we made these casts so people can look at them. But the one is tuberculosis, so if you have really bad tuberculosis, that's what it does to your skull sometimes. You get these holes in your skull. And this is syphilis, so when I always talk to my students, I'm like, safe sex, right? Because stage three syphilis, not a good thing. Especially with like antibiotics. Uh, antibiotic resistance syphilis. Anyway, so we 3D modeled them to see if we could do how accurate we could get, and we're, they're pretty accurate. I mean, the model, 3D model is great, and the nice thing is you're not touching the remains and all kinds of things. Because a lot of breakage happens the more you handle remains. I've been in museums and seen like divots in the head where people put the calipers so they can measure them. I'm like, oh, it's not good. I've seen that a lot because people measure them all the time. But the other thing you can do is facial reconstructions. So this company also has a skull of a young woman that died and body was donated. She was five foot seven, 115 pounds, and they have her face when she was alive, and then they have the skull. And they don't show you the face until you 3D model and make the facial reconstruction. So Emily is doing this as part of her thesis, and she's working on some um, indigenous remains too, but they had testing methods to see how well it works. Because there's a lot of art that goes into this, but there's also some science. She, thought, she did it, and we compared, and actually we both came out with pretty good comparisons. In terms of the structure, it looked like the person. So we've got some of that. And the very last thing is that one of the things I've been doing, I'm working with, I've been working with indigenous remains probably for 15 years, more than that, long time. Um, and I've always done collaborative work, but one of the things we're trying to really push is indigenous-led and indigenous-centric work. And so I did a paper in Ireland with my former grad student, Norma, and my current grad student, Caleb, um, and we talked about some of this work. And one of the things is just thinking about how do we do better anthropology? Um, one of the things is not to discount oral traditions, right? So when Alaska Native people tell you a story, we should listen. Sometimes they tell us stories and then it matches exactly what we found, right? They're like, yeah. So back to Hooper Bay, when I was out there, two elders were out there with me. They were the oldest two ladies in the community. And we were like, we think this is a village. And like, we always thought there was something here. And the village is 700 years old, but they had heard stories about that site and they knew that site was important. But it, in anthropology, in the past, we often ignored those. We prefer written documents. But those are stories that somebody said and wrote down, right? So anyway. Um, but some of the things that people have done is just trying to be more engaged. And this is not just us. I'm just showing you another one where people are doing it with groups from all over the place. Um, and when you work with indigenous groups, sometimes it's helpful to have an indigenous colleague that you can ask questions of and that has an experience, that knows that experience, right? So we've done this on Kenai Peninsula. Uh, that's me, I think, with my pants. Looks like your phone though. That bluff is eroding, and so there was a set of there was a set of human remains that had fallen out of the cemetery that's up above. Um, my colleague, that's the archaeologist at the site, who's passed away, he sent me a picture like two weeks later. That whole site was gone. That whole cliff was gone because of a big storm came through and washed it all away. But we were able to 3D model it and preserve everything. And as a digital site, now they, they have DNA from that site and that's been published and it's connecting to the living people, which is really cool. Um, and then there's a site up in Cape uh, Lisburg Peninsula, way up at the top, up in the Inupiaq area that we've been working on. Same kind of deal. The erosion's happening, they have a runway issue, and there's human remains that are being exposed. And so they've, we've gone up to help them identify and preserve and remove and rebury. Everything's been reburied. So in the old days, those would all come to like a my lab and sit in my lab for 30 years, right? We don't do that anymore. <laughs> Try not to do that. So all those students I showed you and all those colleagues of mine, those are people that actively go in the field and just do it that summer, right? Or do it that month. I've done it in like a week. Like sometimes I've been in a flashlight, I've had a flashlight in my mouth in a closet when the sun wasn't up analyzing human remains until the sun was up. Because I only had a certain amount of time and then I was done, right? But got it done. 
So goals for me is to have these students that I can keep training, but do these ethical things, analyzing human skeletal domains, because there's cool things like 1918 flu. It's the oldest stuff in the Americas, right? There's potential that you could be excavating site, and this has happened. We have sites that are old, we have information that's lost. We have a really old site where the person didn't keep good records. So they can't do anything with that. I mean, it's been people tried for years and they can't reconstruct it, but that could have been the oldest site in Alaska, right? But if we do better work and we're practice and we're community driven, we might know that. Train the next generation to do better, do better than I did, right? Um, and hopefully we'll do better work. Um, it is the oldest place where people are entering the Americas, so it's a super cool location. There's also, because of the way that you can get down there, there's a point where you're just stuck in Alaska and there's not an ice-free corridor to get you down and you can't sail around the iceberg, so you're just kind of sit there. So they, it's a lot of time in Alaska that's before they get down to Montana and Florida and South America. Has a long, amazing history of, um, that we could shed light on. There's a lot of outbreaks in the past. There's also people have been in certain places for 5,000 years, 10,000 years, doing all kinds of cool stuff. Um, I'm presenting a paper in Los Angeles next week on women in the North and just rethinking roles that women played. Like, so there's evidence women were hunting and doing other things, but we often don't talk like that happened, right? It's like, oh, they never did that. It's like, oh. They said they did. So, and we work with indigenous communities to challenge to critique our approaches and actively collaborate with descendant communities. So despite how sunny that looks, that's October in that village I told you about, and that was cold, but it was super pretty, right? The rainbow, and it's crested leaves. I always use this as like my ending slide for this, because it's like really, really pretty, right? But with all this stuff, the cool thing is that Alaska provides a place where there are indigenous people still there, right? I mean, here in Garrett County, we don't have a very good connection with the indigenous communities. When I was dean here, I reached out to the Shawnee. They're in Oklahoma because of the Removal Act, right? Seneca are up in New York. They were probably the closest, and they're also not connected. But we can be more connected. So one of the things is the Maryland Archaeological um, Association has created an indigenous archaeology group again, and they're liaison and doing stuff to make that more active. And there are indigenous sites here in Garrett County. I've seen some of, there's some burials around, there's some old sites. One of my friends in Alaska actually worked at Deep Creek Lake and excavated sites in the 80s. So there's there's, there's, a site, there's a couple points found here that are at least 10,000 years old, so people have been in Garrett County for a long time, too, which is pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, other than that, questions? Yeah? Uh, uh, at the upper San Oh, yeah, for some reason. Uh, yeah, you said you, you found a, a child cremation site that mm -hmm. then later yeah. uh, child burial, so was cremation a they were both. They're all cremated. I should have probably said that. But they're all buried, but cremation, yeah, they were cremated. they've been cremating in that area for a long time. So some of the cultures cremate and some don't. And other cultures, they bury, and then sometimes they bury them, like, laid out, sometimes flex, but these guys were cremating 11,000 years. Does one practice preceding other? In certain cultures, yep. Yeah. And sometimes that's a shift in, like, a culture change. We'll see, like, they'll use that in certain areas, like, oh, they're stopped cremating burials, and they started burying burials, or vice versa. Yeah. So it could go either way. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's different on where they're at in cultures, and you know, some places cremation's never practiced, and some places, some places they just leave it on the surface. I mean, it's different. Yeah, there's a whole like mortuary archaeology class. It's always fun to teach, but that's what they talk about. That just the different ways people do it. And so in like Tibet, they have Tibetan sky burials. They do like they leave bodies out and let the birds get at you, and then they crush you up and do you know, it's kind of cool. It's different. You can Google it. Yeah. Uh, follow, yeah. Yeah, they had fire. So the debate on how old fire is, I brought this picture up because these are the fossil remains. They have fossil remains in Beijing area of China that are 1.2, maybe a little older. They, they go back and forth. And they, but anyway, and I've always said it's so cold there. You live in the caves. You have to have fire. And they found evidence of fire that old. So we think humans have been using it for, let's say, at least, we'll say 700,000 years. But I think it's probably more like a million plus people have been using fire in different ways. So it's a long-term thing. Now, the colder you are, the more you're going to want to use fire. 
saying, right? <laughs> but yeah, it is fire, but there's also other things like clothing. So I didn't talk a lot about what people are doing, but they're making things out of like whale skin and like walrus skin, and they make all kinds of cool stuff out of intestines that are waterproof, which very creative with clothing. They made sunglasses for when they would hunt. So they make these little whale bone goggles and they have little slits in them, but they're, they work like sunglasses, pretty cool. There's actually like, I think Anchorage Museum has like an exhibit where you can see what it looks like to look through them. You can Google it, it's pretty cool. How do you transport skeletal limbs like having a suitcase? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, no, uh, no, there's, <laughs> there's different ways. So, uh, carefully, now we've, uh, styrofoam is one, wrap the bodies up. Um, people have, but oftentimes fly them in the little planes. Um, if it's a full body, recent body, they do have flight services for coffins and stuff, but yeah, we package them up really carefully and we move them around. And I've had, I've been, I mean, I've driven human remains different places and I'm always like, if I get pulled over, it's gonna be weird questions. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of strange things, like, cause I don't have, but when I do remains like this, we, we work with burial permits. So the state gives us a burial permit to move stuff around if that's what we're gonna do. If you're at the site and you're just moving it from one location to the other, it's, you don't have to have that. And we just move them. Need to have better. They know about it, but we just move them around. That's a good question, though. How do we move these human remains? Anybody else? Yeah. Well, uh, when you talk about the uh, 19 and oh, yeah. uh, and the village that lost 80 out of 88, it's about the Yeah. Uh, I'm guessing, like, in that area, the villages are even far behind. They're, they're separate. I mean, I here's a, I don't have a, I guess I have a map, but it's not close up enough for you to see it. This is the area, so that top part where it says Point Hope. But yeah, there's there's villages through, I mean, but they're, they're probably, sometimes they're not that far apart, but maybe 10 miles apart and stuff. You might have another village, or maybe 20 miles up a river, you'll have another village. Well, I mean, I, I guess, well, my question is, uh, the eight survivors, would, it, would it, but, uh, a nearby village Take that yeah, I mean, something like that would happen. And the context for Brevik Village, or Brevik Mission again, is that it was a mission. So this was a mission site. So this was like a church had come in, and this was kind of like one of those residential school areas too. So local communities still around. But yeah, the flu hit a lot of communities in the area. Um, and they, there's a description on how they buried them, but they had to go up there with like water cannons and open the permafrost and bury them in a mass grave kind of thing so they could get them buried. I guess that's the better question. Yeah? So when they find these bodies that die from the flu, the permafrost, mm -hmm. are those viruses still alive? Yeah, that's what I was talking about. That was what uh, we were talking about. Chris and I were talking about just before this. Um, there's debate. I'm actually on a group right now where they're, they're from out of Duluth, and they're from medical school. And there are human remains eroding, and one of the things they're wondering, is, and we have a biologist from UAA that's part of the group that has tested for things like cholera, and um, I, he's testing for t TB in the water, and they're going to test, find out. But the 1918 flu, I mean, you saw the first time they couldn't get an extraction. I mean, it was like they had to do DNA work, and it's intensive. So they, it wasn't like it was, you just get it, but that's the concern. Is it going to be something that erodes out and it's still viable? If it's more recent, yes. <laughs> like, like that's there. I mean, there's books written about that where the permafrost melts and then we get a new virus coming out, right? But there are some, there is a new pox out there, I think, right now that's currently something related to that. But yeah, different things for sure. Yeah, that's a good question. They are, but as these cemeteries erode, that's one of the questions is to test the water, test the bodies in the water, make sure it's not something. But you should always, if it's something you're worried about, and it's permafrost, you should be suited up anyway, probably, right? Oh yeah. So in reference to language, I mean, whenever you go into the villages or different areas, I mean, is there a language? I mean, is there a tribe of person or a council community? Yep. Or you, so how do you communicate mm -hmm. to both? Most people speak English. Some Russian because it was Russian colony first. But there's so much colonization that it's been heavily impacted. There are only. A I mean, there, I shouldn't say few, but there are people that speak the language traditionally and they're really working to revitalize language and teach it. And they actually have a school in Anchorage now where you can go and learn one of the indigenous languages from grade school up. They have like, they used to, my daughter went to the German one, but now they have a Alaska native one that you can learn, Yupik. But, so there are people that speak it, but everybody speaks English because of missionization. And 
Yes. And that's one of the things. So Fairbanks has a big language revitalization program. So some of these maps I've shown you, that's the stuff they work on is, yeah, they're constantly trying to preserve languages. That's a huge part of their focus is working with elders and having elders record things. So like that's a Fairbanks language map, but they, Jared Smith, for example, is doing this cool, his thesis, he's an archeologist, but he also has studied enough language that he goes through on sites and he's renaming the landscape in traditional Denina, into traditional Athabascan words, so Dene words, and they're telling him, oh, that's what we call it. And so then he's redrawing maps with those words. A great example is Denali, right? What did it used to be called? Right, yeah, he's never been to Alaska, right? That was why they were always so mad. They're like, why, Ohio got to name our mountain? And so they changed it back to Denali, which is the traditional Athabascan Dene name, right? Yeah. With the elders, did you ever run across where, like if you would come across remains and I'd be like, no, leave it alone. Yeah. Or some they communities don't want to deal with them. And some communities just leave them the way they, where they're at, yeah. Um, sometimes they will want you to, like, yeah, put them right back. Uh, yeah. That happens. It depends on, that's why each community is different. And each, it can be different because you might just have one person on the council that's also not okay with stuff. I've had projects where we were gonna move bodies and then one of the younger people was like, I don't wanna move those bodies. Anymore. Good, right, yeah, <laughs> that's the way it works. But in the old days, I mean, anyway, there's a guy that basically started anthropology in the US for my field, biological anthropology, and there's accounts of him, his, it's in his own diary, where he like snuck around and stole the remains at night and stuff. So like, and they went to the Smithsonian. They're still there actually. Those like these casts that are on here. The reason I show them is because I th it's problematic that we have those two, these two because they're at the Smithsonian, but they shouldn't be at the Smithsonian. They, they're going back now, but then you can still buy these individuals for three hundred nineteen dollars, right? Which I have done to talk about the ethics of that. But like, it's not like they donated their bodies to science. It's somebody dug them up or. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, sometimes that's one of the things we're doing. So just the two-stage project for that one that Jennifer's working on is we have to get the extract the ancient DNA first. So she's working on extracting that ancient DNA. Whoops, where'd that go? And once we have that, then we're gonna go back to the community and ask them who wants to volunteer and they can do swabs and then we can compare and see who's related. I'll give you a, another example. I, I got called by the, or emailed by the um, state troopers in Alaska not very long ago. They have, I think, seven cases where they have DNA from human remains, but they can't find matches. So they asked, do I know some people that would be willing to come and donate DNA to see if there's a relation? So I contacted people I know and that are indigenous, and some are willing to do it, and some are not. But they're, those are, like, those could be missing and murdered indigenous women, like parts of homicide cases, right? Those are active things that they're working on. So. It goes always, and that's the thing with like this one. We didn't know until we ran how old it was. I could tell it had been in the soil for a while, but like I couldn't tell you it was 600 years old by looking at it, right? I'd have to do a radiocarbon date. And so it could have been that that was a homicide case. There, I looked at some of the stuff that the Baker Hansen had done. He had killed, he's the one that used to like hunt people, like fly them out and then hunt them. They made a couple movies about it. Nicolas Cage was in the last one. But I've seen some of his. So there could be homicides, and that's the, we always try to make sure that's not what it is before we're, and then we can work with the communities. But so cops are always involved. That makes sense. State troopers, tribal police, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, hypothetical. Mm -hmm. In uh, excuse me, in uh, Africa mm -hmm. recently, there has been additional evidence. We look at all different ways that people, yeah, orientation. Yeah, yeah. I will tell you, having buried dead bears, which way you think is the easiest way to bury a dead body? You think that's the easiest way? 
Whoops, that's not right. That one. No. Yeah, fetal position is the easiest. You have to big, dig a deep, little smaller hole. I'm telling you right now. Like, I've done a lot of digging in, like, tundra, gravel. I guess Alaska, Anchorage doesn't have so much tundra, but this kind of heavy gravel and with pickaxes and shovels, it's much easier to do a flex burial. But, so sometimes it's ease, and sometimes it's religious. Some people face a certain direction. There's religious ideals about that. Um, with Alaska, it shifts like cremations. There was obviously a religious ideology behind that, right? And you would talk to each community, find out why they did that. But yeah, absolutely. The way you bury your dead means a lot. That's one of the big things we study. That's why I have her up there, is because that's not how they bury the dead in that community. They bury the dead with objects, and they bury them flexed in a position, and they have like all these grave goods. She has no grave goods, and she's kind of like, looks like she's thrown in that pit. So that's where we've talked about maybe her not being the same as everybody else in the community, right? So yes, um, I'll give you another modern example. I worked on some remains that were excavated earlier, but they were Chinese burials, and those were buried like outside the European cemetery, right? And even the ones at Carluck, which are in Alaska, the Chinese came up and did canning at the salmon fisheries. They're buried in a slightly different location. So you can see where like the Italians are buried, you can see where like, the Norwegians are buried, right? Where the Alaska Native people are buried, all within the same cemetery because it's like segregated out. And if you're not Russian Orthodox, then you're buried somebody else, right? Because that's the way it worked. But yes, all those things have meaning. So it's harder when you're like, you know, a million years ago. But when you're within like 100 years, you can start asking people and they'll tell you if you listen. Right? Yeah. yeah. Can you, uh, for a time on, Purposes. So when, did they, when did the land bridge separate? Oh, yes, they have. Put that on here, but that happens. There's like, they have some different estimates on when it's gone, but they, they think it's done by about like 13,000. So that's why I say at least 13,000, like around there. And I, I could give you the exact date if I had it up here, but I don't. But that's when the bridge is no longer, like it's water at that point, right? You mentioned that like once that happened, uh, there still there was a reason that people were still saying, so Oh, yeah, so. So right off this map, no, uh, this is the bridge. And what it, it doesn't really separate. Like, it's not like they're moving. It's just the ocean levels go up, right? So the oceans rise as the ice age melts. So as the ice starts to melt, the ocean levels go up. And as they go up, you get those two continents are separated. But then over here, there's still ice sheets. There's these two big ice sheets. And they eventually melt a little bit, and there's a passageway through. That's the ice-free corridor is what they call that. And it kind of comes out in Montana. It goes down through Canada and comes out in Montana. So I guess the only one that would show that is this, this one. Where did it go? But it doesn't really show it. It's the, I went the wrong way, sorry. This one kind of shows the Montana site, but you can see like right there, that Anzic one, which again, I didn't put that image in there. That's Montana. And then the rest up there are the Alaskans. So that at some point, they call it the Beringian stanza hypothesis. It just means that they were stuck there and then they came down. But once they can, people are everywhere. How and long were they stuck there about? Like a thousand, a couple thousand years, something like that. And Ben Potter, who's on a couple of these things with me, he's one of the, he's the expert. He's the one that did this this work here. He's got some he's got an article all about how long he thinks they're there. But it's again just debated. It, every new site tells a new thing, right? And then we get sometimes we get a site that's a little older and then we shift our theories around to be like, okay, maybe it was slightly older than we thought. Plus, the climate data is getting better. They're doing more with climate data, testing the ice sheets and ice cores. But it's cool. It's fascinating stuff. If you ever want to see people get in arguments, go study like the <laughs> who's got the oldest site. Everybody wants to have the oldest site, right? <laughs> All right. There's the oldest site claim right now is in Oregon. It's 16,000 years ago. I didn't put it on here though because other people get mad. That, but that is like the one that the, they're arguing that's the oldest site. But I'm telling you, the oldest well-dated site that everybody agrees on. And I went to Mississippi last week and talked to another person that does this kind of work. They, uh, Swan Point's pretty good. So that's, we're safe with Swan Point about 14,000 years ago. It's a little older than that. But <laughs> Bluefish Cave says 23,000. That one's it's iffy. But, um, but do you see that site over, in, it's 30,000 years ago. So we know that they're there 30,000 years ago. So they're probably in Beringia sometime. We just don't have the site that's there. It'll just, that's the key is when do you find a site slightly older, but they're doing all kinds of cool underwater archaeology, and there's drones and stuff like out there. It's cool. <laughs> stuff is neat. Anyway, questions? Yeah. 
It seems soft, but I mean, it, the permafrost frozen layer is below all that where you're at. So that's like the growth of the permafrost, but that's the stuff like where the berries grow and all, like all the bush. It's kind of cool because it's almost like a desert, right? Like it's a very unique environment. Um, but we're actually doing a project on water security in Nevada and Alaska because of those kind of things, because similarities in water. But yeah, permafrost is unique. But yeah, it's that melting layer that's below that that's bad. So that you don't want that because that's where like the stuff sits on top of the permafrost and stuff, right? Because you always have snow come in and out, but the permafrost is that permanently, permanently has it, right? Now, frozen. So they, they went under that when they buried those bodies as well. And it's further up north than Denali. It's way up here. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure I want to ask the question. I'm going to ask the best I can. Yeah. What are the environmental effects on set of remains um, geographically? Are they, are they different from Mexico, Alaska, more or less preserved? Yeah, and that's why I showed that when I talked about the body farm. It's kind of why I put it in here. I was trying to show you these eco regions. Each one of those is going to do a different thing to those sets of human remains. It's, it's real different. So example is like I bury those dead bears in that uh, little patch of woods there. But because it's Alaska and it gets cold and it freezes for long periods of time, they don't decompose as fast as if I buried them in like Nevada, right? Like it's just different. Or if I buried them in Morgantown versus even up in Garrett, and there's probably differences just because of the altitude and how cold it is versus how warm it is. I mean, things just, so that's what the body farm originally started is to try to test that. But then they realized they had to pick different climates. So there's now one in Colorado and there's one in, mm -hmm. yeah, because they're trying to figure out these different climates and how fast they're gonna go. Because the homicide cases, it changes, right? Time of death, all those types of things. It's important stuff. So you have to the tool. Yeah. And sometimes you don't get very good preservations because of certain environments. Sometimes you get great preservation because it's like a dry environment. It's where we get like mummified bodies sometimes because it's just a dry cave and they mummify. They have some mummies in Aleutic, or out in the Aleutian Islands, but those were intentionally kind of made. The oldest mummies, I think I talked to this last talk, are in like Chile, not in Egypt, right? Yeah, <laughs> they were mummifying stuff down there in a long time ago. But Wait, was that natural mummification? They were, that was, no, that was intentional. They were mummifying bodies and putting them in caves and stuff. But it was probably, I mean, even the Egyptians, it's probably initially natural and then they recognized it and then they started making it happen more often, right? Which is kind of interesting. Yeah. I'm gonna donate my body as science. My wife says no, but I don't know, whatever. I'm gonna, because I figure if I spent my whole life studying bones, somebody would be able to study my bones, right? That's kind of physics fair. So I tried to get my kids, speaking of just mummification, to somebody to take my meat suit, and nobody wants that. Like, I was like, what about the soft tissue? Uh, nothing, I thought I'd put it in a jar, you know? Eyeballs or something, I don't know. Well, yeah, yeah, you can, yeah, you take off enough of the flesh. <laughs> you can get stuff to fit, but. Thinking about what people do with bodies, people do all kinds of interesting things with human remains. That's all I'm saying. So, mine will be interesting. You can donate yourself to one of these body farms, and then they'll massacate you for you. So, to put in there, do not put me in like wood chip or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, can't you just use like well, that's what I did with bears. It's much easier. So, but they decompose different rates. Like, and so they've done. They used for years use pigs because pigs are good analogy for animal or human. But they, the body farm has shown repeatedly that the pigs don't necessarily mimic the humans the same because of just different gut bacteria and all the other things that happen. So they're close, but they're not as good. So they they've been arguing for human remains, and some people are all about donating their bodies to science right? for different reasons. You mean obviously you could donate your organs and then the rest of the body goes to some place like Tennessee. <laughs> anyway, which is close by. Any other questions? Get off tangent on donating my body science. <laughs> I have some cool fractures. I think some people would want to know. And if I told how I had them, right, you could like test them. Like I'd be like the answer key. Write down all my stories. <laughs> anyway. Well thanks. If you have questions, I'm uh, happy to stay and talk to somebody afterwards, but yeah, thanks.